punch and uh, celebration of Sumi Madhok's new book, Vernacular Rights Cultures. Uh, I'm Anne Phillips from the government department of LSE, and uh, I'll be chairing this meeting. Uh, the, event, uh, the event is being recorded um, and will be available later as, uh, as a podcast. Uh, so we have um, uh, four speakers who will be commenting on uh, raising questions uh, about the book uh, Sumi will then uh, say a few words, and then we'll have, you know, a good, uh, I think, 20 to 30 minutes for uh, questions and answers at the end. So um, the easiest thing, I think, is probably if you use the, um, the motif in reactions to raise your hand, and then I can use that to call on you uh, to speak. Um, if there's anyone who prefers to write there, question in the chat, then uh, I'll try and keep an eye on that too, and read out as many as we can fit in. Uh, so, um, so let's, let's go. Let me first of all, just say something uh, about, about Sumi um, and the book. So Sumi is a professor of political theory and gender studies at uh, LSE. Um, this book, Vernacular Rights Cultures, uh, do I have a copy of it here? Uh, the, uh, the Politics of Origins, uh, Human Rights and Gendered Struggles for Justice. Uh, this book is the outcome of many years work and I think many and, and varied uh, intellectual engagements. And I mean, for myself, I've, uh, I've admired uh, Sumi's work from, uh, from some time before, before I met her, in fact. I mean, I first came across her work when I was uh, reading around feminist debates on um, agency and autonomy. And I read her, her wonderful PhD thesis, which was already drawing on the, um, the ethnographic work that, that has come to characterize her approach to political theory, a kind of combination. Um, and of course, already challenging much received opinion about how to think about autonomy and rights. Uh, Sumi uh, later became a colleague at the LSE Gender Institute. And, and among the many projects she was working on then was one that involved uh, tracking the, the ways in which uh, people in grassroots movements, but particularly women in rural grassroots movements, were, uh, were using the notion of hack, the Urdu and Arabic word hack, as part of the way in which they were making claims, rights claims. Um, and this, this became um, some of the work of this eventually mushroomed into vernacular rights cultures, which I think is a book that uh, is going to really significantly frame future discussion. It's a critique, not surprisingly, of much conventional rights thinking, uh, you know, with its stories of an exclusively European origin of human rights and its time and space provincialism. But I think Sumi, uh, Sumi's not interested in pursuing just some pure alternative language of rights untouched by um, or delinked from global discourse. She's much more interested in tracing the very specific ways in which rights talk travels. And um, it's, it's a sort of, it's a hugely challenging and important book. And I've learned an enormous amount from Sumi um, over the years in which I've known her. And, and so I'm, I'm very, very glad that the book is now available uh, for everyone to read. Now we have um, four uh, speakers who will each speak for about uh, 10 to 11 minutes. I'm very precise there. Um, uh, about the book. So um, starting with um, Letitia Sabse, who is uh, um, also at the LSE uh, Gender Department, uh, Associate Professor in Gender and Contemporary Culture. Uh, her work very much interrogates the entanglement between sexuality, subjectivity, and political ideals of freedom and justice. Uh, so looking at the, the processes and challenges of cultural translation across disciplines and transnationally. And her books uh, include uh, The Political Imaginary of Sexual Freedom. Uh, Kalpana Wilson uh, is at Birkbeck, a lecturer at Geog in geography at Birkbeck, uh, and her, re her research addresses questions of race, gender, labor, neoliberalism, reproductive rights, uh, with a particular focus on, on South Asia. And she, she published a, a major critique of uh, development theory, um, book on race, racism and development. Um, and uh, among other things also uh, 
uh, co-edited a collection with Sumi and myself on gender agency and coercion. Uh, John Charlecraft is uh, one of my colleagues in the government department, uh, where he's professor of Middle East history and politics. And his books, uh, his books include one on the striking cabbies of Cairo. So that's another combination of ethnographic work with theoretical intervention, uh, but also a later, um, a later book on popular politics in the making of the Middle East, which is a kind of has an amazing, uh, amazing range uh, across the history and politics of North Africa and the Middle East. And then our final speaker is uh, uh, Kim Hutchins, who's Professor of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary College, Queen Mary University, sorry, it used to be called college, that's why I said that, uh, who specializes in political and international theory, feminist thought, global ethics, uh, and the political theory of violence. And in fact, her most recent book is uh, Violence and Political Theory, which, uh, which she wrote with uh, Elizabeth Taylor. She's also um, been involved in a, a really interesting project on recovering uh, the, uh, the role of women, um, particularly in the 20th century in international theory and international thought. So we have uh, four uh, fascinating uh, lineup, of, uh, lineup of four speakers. Um, and uh, so can I hand the stage first of all to you, Letitia? Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Anne. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yes, right? I'm always having trouble with sound, so. <laughs> so, first of all, Sumi, uh, I want to thank you, not just for inviting me to this panel, although I'm thankful for that too, but for writing this book. I think it's a precious gift that you have offered us. And I have also noted that I do think that it's going to impact centrally in forthcoming debates about rights claims and struggles for justice. Um, I personally learned a lot of this book in particular. So in the 10 minutes that I have, I would just like to highlight some of your key interventions, interventions, the word that Sumi loves, uh, particularly those that I will suddenly take forward for my own work. So this is a, an interested commentary. So as Anne has introduced you to the main lines of the book, Sumi makes the case here for the need to radically think or rethink the way we theorize human rights and rights politics and the onto epistemologies associated with them, disputing what she calls the politics of origins that have shaped the main read Western philosophical and political theories of rights. We can surely agree and ally with this endeavor, and I personally do, but here I want to highlight some important points that she makes. First of all, that by the politics of origins, Sumi not only refers to the Eurocentric vision that has framed the canonical histories and theories of rights, but also <clears throat> points to the coloniality of knowledge that traverses their critique as developed by a number of renowned critical scholars, such as radical philosophers, Jacques Franciere, Etienne Balibar, but also feminist political theorists like Wendy Brown. Sumi shows in this book how these critical accounts offered by these scholars aimed at radicalizing the emancipatory potential of rights, if understood otherwise, still hold as their point of reference Western North Atlantic histories and theoretical traditions, reinforcing in this way their epistemic authority over and against what happens in most of the world. This is important because when referring to rights here, Sumi is not just thinking about doctrines, but rather about the social struggles and practices around rights and how they might look like. It is about, or what is at stake here, is what can we identify as a right claim at all? And how can we imagine 
the rights bearing subject associated with these claims. But on the other hand, even if Sumi's project is concerned with decolonizing knowledge, she's also wary of decolonial scholars' proposal to delink from these worldviews, even if these worldviews enact a form of erasure of the subaltern life and knowledge about rights in most of the world. And in this, at this point, she calls attention to the fact that both historically and in her present, vernacular rights cultures developed intention, conflict, and ultimately in an agonistic contact with global human rights talk, international institutions, and state governmental powers and actors that are in constant negotiation with these international frameworks. So there's nothing pure in, Mal, in Sumi's notion of the vernacular. So here is one of the major challenges that the book poses for us, namely, how to examine these vernacular rights cultures that produce their own political imaginaries and subjects in their specificity and complexity, given that, as she highlights, these are contextually specific and in this sense, incommensurable in their singularity. While there is no claim to purity here, Sumi also emphasizes that to honor this specificity, we need to understand these cultures not as derivatives of the hegemonic, my word, the hegemonic language of rights, as the, if they were local versions of a presumed and all-powerful universalized notion of human rights or rights neither as fundamentally or exclusively oppositional responses to it, as if these vernacular rights cultures had emerged and developed just to counter those hegemonic global versions. That scholarly attitude would basically entail a form of stubborn narcissism that cannot help insisting in recentering the legacy of Western modern ones, traditions once again. He assumes is more aligned with authors like Arturo Escobar, who within, Latin America, within the Latin American tradition worked with the idea of multiple modernities, and more recently proposed the notion of the pluriverse, which Sumi also engaged with. But very pointedly, Sumi also highlights the need for a feminist perspective here one that also accounts for the conflictual intersectional subjects that differentially participate or are marginalized within these struggles. The vernacular is not exempt from hierarchies, exclusions, and power-laden dynamics. The vernacular is not the site to idealize a straightforwardly speaking, a straightforwardly speaking of emancipation or equality, but rather as an ambivalent space, as Sumi powerfully shows through the stories of the Sathins and the Bill activists. And in particular, I was very moved by the stories that she tells of leader women activists, Banwari Devi and Napi Bai. This feminist perspective is also one that is only made possible by a critical politics of location that accounts for our position and investment in the field or the vernacular in this case. It is based on these insights that then Sumi proposes a feminist historical ontology. This feminist historical ontology proposes a methodological framework that would not only be able to account for how vernacular modes of conceptualizing rights emerge, circulate and are negotiated, telling other stories about rights, but one that is also about developing concepts that allow us to understand these negotiations or circulations as epistemic sites. That is granting these concepts epistemic authority, not in reference to a presumed center, but in their own right, paying attention to the ontological effects that these concepts have, as Sumi says, following hacking, making up people and worlds. A feminist historical ontology would open then the path to the conceptual diversity that Sumi reminds us that we need. Easier said than done, we might think. Well, 
What is particularly striking of the book for me is how she shows us how to do this through her investigation of hack. Hack, the word for write in Arabic, Urdu, but which has been traveling and uh, incorporated in other languages in South Asia, in South Asia, has been the object as unsaid of inquiry, study for Sumi for many years. And it is drawing on her work on the Rajasthan in India and the Punjab in Pakistan that Sumi follows the uses of hack by the lead, the lead women struggling for the right to food, where hack works as the moral right and indissociable to a claim to truth. Adivasi's claims to their forest, where it becomes then a right that has a cosmological uh, underpinning and is based on the inseparability of the individual and the collective, and the Mazarin mobilizations for land rights, for instance, where Hag speaks to popular Islamic understandings of rightfulness and ownership. Doing this work, Sumi turns then the vernacular term Hag into a concept, and a concept that challenges, establishes notions of rights, rights making, and rights claiming and the forms of political subjectivation they entail. But this challenge does not come from critique, but through a genuine expansion of our conceptual vocabularies. This is Sumi's offer, her gift. Now, to understand better the amazing work that this impulse towards conceptual diversity might do, I would like then to ask a couple of questions, maybe a as the provocation to keep the conversation going. So the first one on the vernacular, you follow the vernacular through subaltern struggles, in tension with constitutionalist and development, de developmentalist forms of governmentalized power. But I was wondering if you can tell us more on the question of how might these governmental actors inform those vernacular rights cultures? More specifically, how you conceptualize the relationship between the vernacular and the, sub and the subaltern, mostly at the point where you differentiate it from counter development. The second, more general, is about translation. Basically, my query is concerned with how to negotiate the contextual specificity you ask us to account for through the development of these concepts and the possibilities of these concepts beyond their specific location. What might we learn from this feminist historical ontology of hack that could inform other analysis? How we might negotiate or avoid really questionable forms of appropriation if we take up your work on this historical ontology of hack? how that epistemic, a specific epistemic authority is to be honored. On the other hand, if concepts are not translatable, if they point precisely to the untranslatability or incommensurability between vernacular culture of rights, how to avoid them being reduced or reincorporated as the particular as the local, as yet another case. You criticize translation in the sense of understanding vernacular rights culture as a translation of a preconceived universalized idea of human rights. And of course, I agree with this critique. But what I am thinking of is of potential dialogues or even alliances between different subaltern struggles and vernacular concepts. How untranslatability and communication might be negotiated here. I, I ask this because you argue that we do not need more theories or it's not more theories that we need so much, but rather more concepts. However, I see in your book that you develop a whole theory of vernacular rights cultures. Maybe that is the concept and I, am, I misunderstood the whole book. And you also develop a whole theoretical framework to approach them. 
And I see how this will surely be taken up by others and it could easily travel to other sites. Actually, that's going to be part of my work. Anyway, so those are my questions for you. Such a privilege to read you, Sumi. Thank you for this book. Thank you very much, uh, Leticia, for that, uh, that uh, contribution. Uh, Kalpana, can we uh, move on to uh, give you a chance to uh, make your comments? Uh, yes. Um, well, echoing Leticia, I'm really thrilled to be part of this launch uh, for a book which I've personally been waiting for with great anticipation. And for me, this book is both uh, very exciting intellectually and very important politically at this juncture. And of course, needless to say, the two are not really separable from each other. Um, this book, as Sumi explains, comes out of many years of ethnographic, theoretical and conceptual work. And of course, this book comes to us via her earlier very important work on agency um, published in her 2012 book and elsewhere. And I've been lucky enough to witness some of this process um, through conversations I've had with Sumi during what I think is uh, hard though it is to believe now about 15 years, um, beginning with not only some uh, shared concerns we had between her engagements with women who were grassroots workers in the development program in Rajasthan and mine with uh, women agricultural laborers movements in Bihar, but also a shared preoccupation with the need to question the notion of agency and its deployment. Um, now, while I could characterize these conversations very broadly as a productive encounter between Marxist and post-colonial feminisms, this would definitely be uh, a very big oversimplification. And also, of course, it wouldn't convey Sumi's deep warmth and wicked sense of humor, which has made these conversations so much fun. Um, now, in this beautiful book, and before I say something about what's in it, I would just like to comment on the beautiful cover of the book, which, like much else in the book, has multiple meanings embedded in its design and its color scheme. And it would be really nice to hear from Sumi if she has time about the thinking which I'm sure went into the design of the cover. Now, the book has at its core, as we've heard, a series of um, interlinked, located feminist ethnographies, which cross and blur the artificial colonial boundaries, uh, which mark South Asia's history and present. We travel, um, from right to food, forest rights and Dalit rights movements in Rajasthan in India to land rights movements in um, Pakistan and Punjab. And this choice in itself is a deeply political one. Now more than ever, when these national boundaries are being violently reinforced and instrumentalized for far right political projects. And in this context, I'd like to briefly refer to what Sumi writes about Urdu in relation to the central concept of Haq. So she explains that despite quite a low percentage of speakers of Urdu as their mother tongue in both India and Pakistan, Urdu, um, and I quote, extends an important influence on the cultural and literary landscapes and this extends to the domain of social struggles and movements. And she has tracked this um, in some of her other work as far as Manipur in Northeast India. So uh, as Sumi says, Huck then pushes through to the surface to emerge as the foremost and most recognizable word for a right within subaltern struggles in the subcontinent. And this is particularly significant when right now the Indian state under a far right and Hindu supremacist government is actively trying to deny and erase both the influence of the Urdu language and precisely this kind of syncretism which is so deeply embedded in cultures of dissent and resistance. And this itself in turn has become a site of struggle. 
So now, a few years ago, after he had heard Sumi speaking about her work at a workshop, the post-development and decolonial theorist Arturo Escobar, who Leticia has already mentioned, uh, commented that while some post-colonial scholars have talked about the need to provincialize Europe, Sumi's research and scholarship actually does this work. And she does this in this book by mapping and exploring those other human rights stories, which, as she explains, are ignored both in the dominant liberal accounts of human rights and also, as we've heard, in the radical critiques of human rights, uh, both of which accept a racialized narrative of human rights as being essentially European. Now, of course, it's been an avowed aim of many decolonial thinkers to go beyond the post-colonial critique of European hegemonic discourses and to actually engage with multiple epistemologies in the global south, or what Sumi reminds us is actually most of the world. Yet I think what Sumi does in this book also goes beyond this aim of making visible other epistemologies. And she does this in two ways in particular. So first of all, there's her refusal of the politics of origins, rejecting the notion of what she calls hermetically sealed or pure, authentic and originary rights traditions in favor of her much more complex reading of how vernacular rights cultures actually come into being. And then secondly, there's the fact that she engages with the oppressive and exploitative relations within particular communities and she reveals the multiple contestations of concepts like Hark within them. Most importantly, she engages through this with the visions of social transformation which emerge from these contestations by centering claims for rights articulated by Dalit and Adivasi women who are at the forefront in many contexts of resistance to neoliberal global capitalism. Now, I find this book extremely important and timely for one more reason. I mean, actually there are many, but I wanted to talk about this one. Um, right now we're seeing some major attempts by the Hindu supremacist far right in India and the Indian diaspora to appropriate decolonial language. Um, the notion of coloniality is actually being used by them to repackage and legitimize the demonization and persecution of India's Muslim and Christian minorities, who despite being marginalized economically and socially are represented in these discourses as alien invaders. It's being used to claim that caste is an orientalist colonial fantasy and that to seek its annihilation is a new colonial project. And decolonial ideas are being invoked to delegitimize the rights enshrined in India's constitution, which many resistance movements from below draw upon in complex ways, as Sumi has shown us. In fact, the, co the constitution, which was drafted by the Dalit thinker and leader, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, is being represented as an alien imposition of enlightenment thinking in precisely the way which Sumi warns us against. Now, despite this, we've recently seen at least one prominent decolonial theorist apparently falling for this narrative, at least temporarily. It's important to realize that the Hindu supremacist use of decolonial narratives is not, however, a matter of cultural relativism as a reaction to colonialism or globalization. In fact, the Hindu supremacist far right is itself deeply colonial in its origins, and also today is deeply enmeshed with contemporary imperialism, both in its affiliation with the interests of global corporate capital and in its alignment with US and Israel-led foreign policy. So as another person whose work focuses on South Asia in a time not only of majoritarian regimes across the region, but of what many of us see as a fascism in India, it's deeply heartening then that through this book, Sumi firmly reclaims the decolonial 
for multiply situated projects of transformation, of social justice, and ultimately of hope. Thank you very much, Kalpana. That was uh, that was a really uh, great contribution. Um, John, uh, can I pass over the sure. microphone, the virtual microphone, to you? Sure. Thank you so much. And echoing the others, uh, I'm very grateful to be here. And thank you very much to Sumi, the author, also to give us the chance to to read this uh, fabulous book, Vernacular Rights Cultures, and to engage with it. And I'm just um, grateful to be part of the conversation and. Uh, and I think you know I'm I'm on a learning I'm on a learning curve here. So um, I think it's it, it, you know I, I I think it's a rich, uh, sophisticated, and accomplished engagement and a and a major contribution to uh, debates about rights and human rights and how they are at work in most of the world, above all in South Asia. But the book addresses what the author. And I think with considerable justification in the context of mainstream studies of human rights calls, quote, a spectacular failure to pay attention to the forms of rights politics engaged in by subaltern groups in most of the world, unquote. So I think it's a distinctive and provocative approach uh, that there's a, on the part of the author, a longstanding uh, interest in self-fashioning and subjectivation of subaltern subjects, and it's informed by an extremely you know, welcome, engaged feminist attention to the gendered politics of location. There's also the historical ontology of, uh, of a philosopher, Ian Hacking, which is refracted through Michel Foucault, but uh, allowing an interrogation of this question, how do words make up subjects? And then allowing this question of what are the epistemic and justificatory premises of different kinds of, of rights claims? And, and there is in the book, of course, a major attempt to get beyond what Sumi calls the politics of origins, a human rights story always centered on, on the West, uh, whether it's celebrated or criticized, and, uh, but never quite transcended. And we get you know, a huge engagement with that in chapters two and three. But there's also the, these live on the ground subaltern mobilizations in various parts of South Asia and how languages of human rights and rights or what the book calls vernacular rights cultures are at work in those mobilizations. And, and the book engages with those struggles using ethnography and field work that goes back at least two decades. And we get that in you know, two substantial chapters, four and five. So for me, in, and I mean, in here, there's some very interesting arguments. There's uh, one of the main ones is that there are four different kinds of epistemic or justificatory premises. Uh, also sometimes written as political imaginaries that inform these vernacular rights cultures. And the four are first, legal constitutional, second, uh, Islam and right conduct, uh, third, um, uh, appeals to the cosmological, prior or ancestral, and fourth, appeals to truth with a capital T. And, and, uh, but above all, I, you know, obviously the argument is that we can't tell a story about human rights and rights as if it was solely a matter of the West or solely a matter of the diffusion or vernacularization or translation from the West, that there are other histories or other politics, uh, a rights politics, a rights politics, I think it's a very appropriate phrase actually, and claims to rights, which are, are best are not adequately described in a kind of West East binary, nor are they some kind of Western monologue, nor are they some kind of non-Western authentic artifact. But instead we can speak about vernacular rights cultures, which in some way predate or jostle or combine with and transform rights and human rights and are intimately interrelated with subaltern mobilizations. There's another uh, argument that's pretty uh, provocative, which is that um, Sumi says that questions around women's rights are not organically tied to subaltern mobilizations. And there's a passage where you discover that some rural female development workers who've been appointed by the state, but, uh, but they're from crucially low caste, um, they, uh, they, they have to kind of learn this language of rights in legal constitutional modes. And because uh, for them, they've confronted the word hack uh, in relation to masculine and caste 
uh, privilege. And so they have to learn this alternate language. Uh, that's very interesting. Some of the things I particularly liked in the book, I, this particular example of the, the Sathins, I don't know how you pronounce that word, but the, um, the rural development workers appointed by the state who initially have this somewhat statist conception set of rights, certainly informed by legal constitutional and developmental discourses, whereby they, they, they speak about you know, certain kinds of rights, but when the state lets them down, as it were, when the state does not believe the testimony of a prominent activist uh, who's been raped, there's a switch to another kind of epistemic justification uh, around um, uh, 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 truth, an appeal to truth. And that I really, I really like that uh, example. I, to me, it was a kind of a, a matter of learning, a process of, of, of sort of pedagogy through activism. And, and, and there's clearly a, some sort of a break where, with, uh, with the more statist language uh, of rights there. Of course, there are questions. I mean, it may be the regime, a corrupt regime that they are targeting, not the state as such. But, you know, of course, there's always questions. But I, I have, so my, my sort of questions and provocations, um, I do have some things to say, but I won't go into it right now about the theoretical framework. I mean, the, the short thing is, um, so we've got Ian Hacking, we've got debates about human rights, a very broad and exciting feminism. There's Foucault, and there's also an ethnography of subaltern mobilization. And I do think that that's a, that's a lot of moving parts. I think there's a, a juggling act. I wonder if there are, there are questions that I wanted to raise. I think there are cracks there, but I'm, I'm not gonna, I don't want to particularly go into that here, but, but, I, but maybe those tensions are also what give the book its sort of productive tension and its distinctiveness and, it, and its originality. I had a couple of questions around, and we've actually heard of something about this already, about the vernacular, about that, that as a language, and maybe here's the thing with the Ian Hacking and whether, you know, is there an adequate theory of language that is the analytical philosophy gonna, gonna bear the weight of a, of a theory of vernacular language and how it relates to, re relates to national languages, and, uh, you know, particularly if there's legal constitutional premises that uh, are at work. Also, the idea of culture, I had questions there, because I, I thought in a way what we had insight into was languages of claim making. I, I wasn't sure whether we had insights into culture, of course, you know, million definitions of culture, but if, you know, if culture is a, a sort of fundamental uh, drama of feeling and knowing, I, I wasn't so sure about whether, whether that, was, that was a culture or not, or, or it, whether in fact it was a language of, of claim making. But, 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 but the, maybe the main thing I wanted to raise and it comes out of what I think, what I really like, what I think is best about the book, um, because it, it, it's this, and the thing I got most excited about, and partly because it resonates with me as a historian of, of uh, the Middle East and North Africa, was this, um, was finally someone has come and said, when we talk about rights, we don't just have to talk about, you know, beginning with the Atlantic revolutions, moving through, you know, to the UN 1945 declaration and then sort of UN institutions, professional advocacy, and then diffusion and vernacularization. Finally, someone's going to say, there's another history going on. So I was very excited about that. And, and because, because, you know, this is something, you know, as a historian of the Middle East and North Africa, um, and I, I can't resist just throwing up a virtual background here that I sometimes use, but it's a petition from 1878. And it's uh, from some humble boatmen in Egypt, but it's full of claims to rights. And uh, well, in Arabic, haq uh, and hukuk. And extraordinarily, the, the claims in this petition are not, you know, they're not even, they're not customary, they're not Islamic, and they're not even about sultanic law. They're about, um, they're about the rights of sheikhs, of guilds to be elected, which was a recent Kind of secularizing reform anyway uh complex but but so many different registers in which rights have been at stake in subaltern mobilizations uh in, in certainly in the middle east and north africa over over decades that 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 i you know finally someone's come and produced a book that that takes something like that seriously so uh, that was for me the main the main excitement and and but that word but then but then but then the, the problem, the puzzle for me, is that that word, haq in Arabic, it, it has so many registers. One, believe it or not, is tax. Another is just wages. 
Another is, uh, you know, it's what I deserve. It's also right conduct, as you just sometimes describe it in a more Islamic register. But it has so many uh, things about, but for me, it maps well onto, you, you know, the part of the book where the rural development workers encounter the, uh, the language of rights as a language of caste and masculine privilege, because it's those men who deserve and have a right to. And it's the caste, the higher caste that deserve and have a right to. And it's partly, that's one of the things going on in the rights languages that, I mean, because of course they can be appropriated in all sorts of different ways as you know, you're assuming that it's very sensitive too. But the, the but is, uh, uh, you know, I, the, the thing, the, you know, the, the, the distinct, you know, the, the declaration of the rights of man and the citizen and all of this thing in the Atlantic revolutions and human rights with this word human attached has this kind of universalizing empty claim to be kind of inalienable. And, I, and it, it's, it's a sort of impossible idea. Uh, and that's why I think the politics of rights is such a good formulation. But, but isn't it, isn't it I, I, I can't help seeing the, the specificity there of that kind of empty claim to universal rights and its, and its impossibility. The, to me, that is, you know, as it were, the critique of the idea of human rights, because it contains this kind of empty universal, a kind of false universalism of liberalism. I have so many critics and, you know, feminists and on and on have, have sort of explained very laboriously. Because remember, there's the part in the book where you say, I agree with a lot of these criticisms of human rights. But then so we wonder, so that just leaves the question. The question always to me is, the, the, the your phrase that in, used in the book is rights slash human rights. But I, so it's that, it's that, it's the part about the, the idea of the human, I mean, I was just, I just read a terrific history of the, 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 how the word human appears, again, it's in Arabic in the late 19th century, but it's, it's a very distinctive usage of the word human. And it has this kind of universalizing emptiness about it. It has this false universalism, if you will. So, so the point is, um, is, isn't there a specificity to a certain kind of, uh, highly problematic uh, uh, deployment of rights and, and, and what happens to that. Uh, and, um, but I, I don't see this as some sort of, uh, you know, major, major criticism, more just a question about how uh, that very tricky negotiation between rights as deployed as a politics of rights as fitting into subaltern mobilizations and this kind of, you know, empty concept of human rights uh, on, on the other side. So that's my main thing. But the fact is, uh, whatever that adds up to, maybe not much, uh, but because uh, but what I just said, because it's such a wonderful book. I think it's a it's a resounding success in terms of several of its key stated aims. The what, first, this uh, the decentering about of familiar narratives of human rights, the the call the, the alternate kinds of historicities. And, and, and Sumi says it's a quote, a call to think carefully about the normative, ontological and philosophical nature of the languages of rights that are deployed in most of the world. I think the book absolutely does that. It's an amazing contribution. So I'm grateful to that, this research and I very much hope that it will be widely uh, read and uh, debated. So uh, thanks. Thank you very much, John. And then uh, finally, uh, over to you, Kim, for your comments. Uh, thanks, and um, and uh, thanks uh, for the invitation uh, to be on this panel. It's a, a huge pleasure uh, to comment on this book. Uh, coming forth, I think some of my comments may rather echo some of the things that my co-panelists have already uh, said. Um, as Anne said right at the beginning, I, I also echo the um, point that I've been following Sumi's work for some time, and it is a, a you know a wonderful body of work that she's produced for us over the years, and one that I always learn from. Um, and I actually wanted to start by quoting from Sumi from another uh, text that she uh, published more recently on feminist debt and the concept of feminist debt. Uh, and she says, to acknowledge one's feminist debts is to acknowledge a responsibility and an ethics where ethics is not limited to knowledge making, but involves a call to responsibility, a responsibility to reproduce conditions of thinkability and to open up possibilities for different knowledges. And I suppose what I would say is that there, 
Sumi sets out a very high bar for academic work, for the production of knowledge, but it is a bar that she rises to <laughs> every time. Um, and her work, I think it was Kalpana who said this, does what so many of us have talked about political theory or ethical theory needing to do, which is to make these moves that provincialize the, uh, the meta-narratives that define so much of what we do. Um, Sumi has genuinely come at doing political theory in a different way and in a way that uh, is displacing of dominant narratives. As, we, as we've heard from other commentators, you know, dominant West-centric narratives about human rights, the Atlantic Charters onwards, as uh, John was just referring to, but also the increasingly pervasive critique of human rights, which in many ways simply recenters a West-centric understanding of human rights. And also I feel particularly powerful for me was her critique of the vernacularization story, uh, which is another obviously narrative told about human rights in which you've got this kind of one way translation, adaptation, mutation to some extent, but you've still got that sense of a very unidirectional political imaginary. And, and Sumi is, is taking us away from all of those three uh, kinds of meta narratives. Um, I just really want to pick up on some of the things that particularly interest me about what she's doing and to maybe raise one or two questions on the way. Um, one point that, that really intrigues me is the ways in which her work here um, disrupts assumptions about the primacy of the written word so that it's actually oral um, cultures, activisms, traditions that she's capturing at least to some extent in the activism that she's exploring. And I'm intrigued by um, how her ethnographic approach is able to bring this out. And um, by the fact that I think this is probably a hugely important part of the way that rights languages are mobilized in many, many different traditions, but which is very rarely acknowledged or, or understood. Um, so there seems to me there's a challenge there for unpacking vernacular rights cultures everywhere because all rights cultures are vernacular. I think that's, you know, that's the point um, that we need to think about all those unwritten assumptions that may underpin rights claims that political actors are, are making and which often relate back to um, not necessarily fully articulated assumptions about entitlements or about privileges or about histories or about particular sorts of origins. Um, and this brings me to a second thing that I think is really interesting and important about what uh, Sumi is doing, which is that she, she raises the issue of the pluriverse and Escobar's work and so on, um, but she also problematizes it. And this seems to me to be quite right, because if you move into the notion that you can separate out ontology and epistemology and privilege ontology, and by doing that, you can somehow get at the subjugated uh, knowledges of, of, of the world then you're actually making assumptions about the um, extent to which ontologies are and must be different. Um, you know, I think of the way that most of us live our lives is not actually through a bunch of enlightenment preconceptions about the relationship between us and the, you know, the Wi-Fi that's not working or whatever else is in the world that is confronting us. Um, and I think in, you know, Sumi's work is basically telling us that we, are open to connection as well as difference uh, and to coming at things in a way that don't foreclose um, commonalities as well as differences in the way that political activism uh, operates in different contexts. So that for me is another really rich sort of aspect of her, of her argument and why I think actually most of the world is, is exactly the right point. And I think most of the world is a lot more perhaps of the so-called West Euro 
Eurocentric world than most people acknowledge. Um, uh, uh, it's actually a very, very small part of the world that is caught up in the, the grand narratives that we were talking about earlier on. Um, so a couple of other things just to uh, queries, questions, issues that come out for me in, in reading Sumi's work. One is actually a direct echo of John's point, which is about the relationship between rights and human rights, or that sort of rights slash human rights in the argument and how it kind of surfaces and then disappears and then surfaces again. And I'm kind of interested in, in how the human does or does not figure in the vernacular rights cultures that you discuss. I mean, one way of looking at it would be to see the humanist coming in when you move away from the constitutional context in which rights debates might be had to call upon other things, cosmologies, truth, you know, other, other sorts of things. I'm not quite sure, but I would be interested in hearing more about how you, how you think about um, that. Um, a second thing is the concepts well, it's a composite. When you make, when a noun becomes a, a verb or something active, gendered, you use gendered a lot. And I'm, I'm very interested in how we think about the kind of um, historical ontology of that term as you use it in the book, the term gendered. And also state actually as being, so the developmental state particularly obviously is very important in your account of these different political struggles. Um, and this sort of pushes me to thinking about the ways in which it, it's, it's back to the point that I think Letitia made concepts and theory, but also how concepts are always um, networked with many other concepts and resonating with and working with other concepts in 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 very complicated kinds of, of of ways and I'm kind of interested in that context with how uh, hi a historical ontology uh, a feminist historical ontology of gender kind of cross cuts the the feminist historical ontology of 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 Hark, uh, uh, and a vernacular rights um, uh, culture. So I'd, I'd just be intrigued to hear what more you'd have to say about that. Um, and then my final um, point, I think would again be perhaps a rather generic philosophical point, and, and that is how you um, focus on the significance of meaning, the, the ways in which concepts carry lots and lots of baggage but at the same time they transform and are transformed as they are put to work uh, by people in different ways in response to different sorts of circumstances and I suppose I'm interested in how where and whether you see the limits to the the, the possibilities of transformation within the use of say hark you know, it, it's got a hugely rich set of possibilities in there, and, and John was talking about that as well. Um, but but I'm intrigued by whether there is th how much are our political imaginary is going to be limited within that vernacular rights culture? How much is actually it really a world of infinite possibility? And does that apply to the concept of, of, of right within, say, an English language tradition or, or whatever it might be. So it's kind of that, that question of the balance between um, baggage that concepts carry and the possibilities of transformation, not just of the people, the subjectivities, which I think you bring out really well, but of their meanings. Um, how, how much are those parameters fixed? How much are they able to move? Uh, so I'll leave it there. Sorry, a, a, a bunch of not terribly well connected thoughts. But thank you so much for the book. It was a huge pleasure to, to read it again, which I did. I, I'd read it in an earlier version. To read it again was just really splendid. So thank you. And uh, thank you to all four of you for, for those uh, wonderful and, and really interestingly different contributions. I mean, there was a bit of anxiety at the beginning that people would end up basically uh, saying the same kinds of things, but actually that your your comments and your thoughts have all been very uh, really kind of interesting in very different ways. And uh, and I think between them, 
convey a, a good deal of what it is that makes this such an exciting and important book. Now, Sumi, um, you must bear in mind that this is a celebration of your book, right? This is not you being subjected to the requirement to answer every single question that has been thrown up in these four contributions. You can't possibly hope to do that. So it's a chance for you to uh, say whatever you want to say, which may kind of riff off some of the things that people have said in their contributions, but please don't feel under any obligation to treat this as a kind of standard <laughs> seminar in which you have to answer everything. But anyway, <laughs> over to you for, uh, for a you. chance to contribute <laughs> to your book. Thank you, Anne, for that. Um, thank you, and um, yes, that, that, that um, yes, takes away some of that pressure. <laughs> because, uh, and, um, because I think that the, comments and the insights and the queries and the questions so phenomenally important and uh, you know and, and I think that because they are so important um, I don't think I'll be able to actually do any justice to them I think they require a lot of thinking through uh, working through and and um, you know uh, spending a lot of time thinking and as Anne's reminded me you know we um, probably won't have that kind of time for that. But I, can I just so, sort of say first, so thank you so much. I mean, John, Anne, uh, Kim, uh, Kalpna, Letty. I mean, uh, what can I say? I'm just so overwhelmed <laughs> that my brain is now becoming really fuzzy. And, but I, it's at the same time, buzzing with all the fabulous uh, ideas uh, and, and, and thoughts that, that, that you've uh, raised. And, you know, and I've been just trying to think um, quite hard uh, and right uh, while you've been saying things. So I'll just, um, uh, you know, so thank you for this. And I, and I hope that you uh, will let me stay with some of the troubles and the ideas that you've raised because I think they deserve that. Um, uh, just very quickly, just the kinds of things that came into my mind, which I can kind of uh, um, just, just so that I have something by way of response and just nothing. <laughs> So I have nothing, um, uh, you know, that um, uh, that I can offer at this stage. So something. So here's something. Um, I think that uh, you know the um, the question of um, un uh, of translation, uh, you know, that you were talking about, um, uh, Letty earlier, is um, about untranslatability and incommensurable and incommensurability. Um, and, and how that and how to negotiate that along with questions of uh, communication with building coalitions with a particular kinds of politics and that's really important. Uh, and the question of politics is very central to the book and, and also building coalitions after all it kind of tracks how political movements and mobilizations um, deploy particular kinds of conceptual back vocabularies and that sustain these. Um, activisms on the ground and also enable to make sense for people to make sense of them right so these are not some kind of things alien things coming from somewhere else people are sort of working and uh, uh, using these and I think that I am in some ways I'm I am what I I'm really doing is what Kim was saying was you know I'm I'm very um, I find the very very problematic this idea of a unidirectional simplistic forms of translation which have a particular you know they have a particular origin they start from somewhere and then they go somewhere else and all that's happening is a kind of vernacularization right so it's being acted upon I think it's that which I'm um, which I'm uh, sort of uh, raising issue with uh, because that of course uh, takes away any 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 concern or any admittance or admission of epistemic authority that might lie elsewhere, right? So that there is no epistemic presence outside of where one is kind of uh, trap, you know, having a, a identified origin from and then moving from there. So I think it's about the question of how to bring subaltern politics and subaltern groups and, and, and as an epistemic presence, right? So not simply as an activist presence or something else, but actually as an epistemic presence. Um, and so I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm sympathetic to questions of incommensurability, but I'm not, I'm not particularly taken in by them. And I think when I am talking about Emily Apter and all that uh, work uh, on, 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 on against world literatures and all of that, I think I'm, I'm, I'm quite skeptical 
mm, in some ways of that of that kind of thinking. I think that there is as a pause and as a gap and, and instituting a pause and thinking about unidirectional translation, yes, but then what, <laughs> right? So I think, and, and as always that question of politics and that's always that question of mm, political, um, uh, transformation and so on are, 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 are so important. And, and I think one of the difficulties with that kind of work is that it doesn't put out what's at stake in terms of the politics of it, right? And so there's often that kind of, so it kind of empties itself out in, uh, in terms of what might be at stake. Uh, if, you, if you think like this, it might make it theoretically very interesting and pure, but at the end of it, what's the politics of it and what kinds of politics does it enable? And for me, it doesn't go very far and so at all. And so I, I talk about it, but I'm not into that incommensurability camp at all. I think it's an in, important idea for disrupting this very uni, unilinear and unidirectional and simplistic. And the fact that you can know simply through that unidirectional translation, you don't know, you need to know anything about the rest of the world or most of the world, right? So that's where I think that question of, um, I thought I'd just simply um, bring that in. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the, when I was thinking about um, uh, the question of politics of origins and Cardinal is so right about, you know, the context going from there to the context, actually, um, the, the, the context within which some of this thinking uh, took, uh, it took form was actually um, in relation to what was going on um, in uh, the, the kinds of things that uh, Kaltner talked about so evocatively and so importantly. But also what was interesting was that, that I found that um, critical discourses of human rights, statist, right, authoritarian statist discourses uh, and critiques of rights, uh, they were all sort of uncelebratory, um, discor uh, you know, uh, uh, talk, rights talk, all seemed to align at one level, and that they were all sharing that that similar framework for thinking about um, human rights, and that is the politics of origin. So whether it was the uh, you know Indian and the Pakistani state sort of saying, well, rights are or human rights are foreign; they are they don't have any basis in Indian or Pakistani culture, right? So you've got that originary thing, so the detractors straight away, or whether you were talking about. Um, the others, the, 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 the critical theorists who were also then very much focused on um, that originary or the Republican moment within um, rights thinking. And then in that moment, reproducing, as Kim said, the, the subject of West as the, uh, you know, uh, reproducing Western subject rights all over again, of course, the celebrators of rights, um, of human rights um, do the same too. So all of them were sharing this sort of common framework for thinking about rights politics, and I thought it was quite extraordinary. And of course, what you see, the stakes are very different and the consequences are very different, right? So on the one hand, you have the epistemic erasure and the removal of the rest of the world from, from uh, any kind of having any kind of epistemic significance for thinking about human rights, right? So nobody talks about so all your critical theorists and the wonderful uh, theorists of democracy and um, and so on will 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 not talk about what's going on in the Middle East or will not talk about what's going on in South Asia or in parts of Africa and so on in terms of subaltern political struggles as examples or indeed from where or starting points of their theory building but they'll go back to the Republican moment uh, of uh, you know rights of man and rights of citizen as providing the sort of way of whether in terms of aporias or in terms of paradoxes or what have you for thinking about rights politics and that's for me was quite extraordinary so you've got that the consequence of the authoritarian regimes uh, again using the originary framework saying that this has got no basis uh, in, in and so therefore questions about gender and sexuality for example or rights to gender and sexuality have no basis in uh, you know in, in culture uh, uh, whatever, whichever place they are talking about, of course, that politics, that discourse is used to to um, uh, come down hard on the politics of democracy and dissent in those countries, right? So you see that the that the consequences are and stakes, the political stakes and struggles are very different. So this is what I was. These are the kinds of things that uh, you know got me thinking about all of these. Um, 
uh, the kinds of ways in which to, uh, in the ways in which human rights politics were being thought about. So yes, so the question of theoretical framework, yes, vernac vernacular rights cultures is a theoretical framework, whereas hack is the concept, right? So uh, so yes, so vernacular rights cultures then provides a theoretical framework and that you can then, uh, for thinking about concepts uh, and languages of claim making in most of the world. Right and 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 of course uh, the uh, the concept that uh, that I'm focusing on one can focus on any other but I found Huck extraordinarily um, productive and generative um, tracked it across uh, you know three different continents to seven different languages and so on and so forth um, uh, is 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 um, is was my entry point uh, into thinking about um, into thinking about vernacular rights cultures. Um, where the human, the, that question what John was, uh, was pointing to and also Kim about the empty signifier, the human as an empty signifier in, in human rights or, uh, you know, as an, as a, if you like, um, uh, what, and, and, and that it kind of appears and disappears from time to time and that there is a slash, the word slash, so rights stroke human rights. And I think that I, I put it there purposely, primarily to show the absent presence, <laughs> that, that in, some, in, some, in some cases, you know, it is a discourse of rights, which is being used, so hug as an entitlement. And, but also, as, as you were saying, John, it's such a, it's, there's so many different normative registers on which hug operates right I mean it's and and one of the reasons why I wanted I, I do this um, documenting the justificatory premises and doesn't like the term justifications but you know the job was primarily to sort of look at the different normative registers on which uh, Huck operates is used and then is seized and snatched and used differently Right. And so, uh, you know, when it is used by uh, Dalit and Adivasi women, uh, you know, the conflicts that ensue. So this is not, uh, you know, some kind of horizontal uh, term. This is not some kind of a term which is outside of power relations, very much reflects the power relations, very much embedded within very particular sets of uh, gendered relations um, uh, and, and, and so on. And, and so when it is taken up and used and deployed, uh, and, and by the way, seen as a very alien term as well by these women, because they, they have never used this term before. Uh, you know, many of these, uh, you know, uh, people that I'm talking about, they, they've never used these terms before. They have, because these terms have a very particular normative uh, standing. Um, and so, and that's where the, and, and, and that's where the conflict, and that's where the sort of um, uh, oppression and the, um, you know, and, 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 and so on occur. But, but the interesting thing is that while all of that is going on and within, and that's why I wanted to look at how collective mobilizations, the kinds of intersectional oppressions and marginalities within collective mobilizations, uh, so as to not romanticize these social movements as though they are the panacea of, uh, you know, of, 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 of everything, right? That's what you actually see in some of the things that, you know, in some of the kinds of the work on Florida's and decolonial things. And somehow I find that there is certain romanticization of social movements or turning to epistemologies of social movements and, and indigenous. And therefore the question always is, but you know, why are you evacuating power relations from those as though, and of course, the moment you sit, start thinking about questions of gender and sexuality, uh, you know, they are right there in front of you, start seeing things. And that is why it, uh, uh, this question of politics has been so important in thinking about concepts. So yes, concepts carry baggages and, and, and they are also, but they're also transformed when they're put to use, Kim, exactly as you were saying, they're, they're transformed when they, are, when they are put to use. And one of the ways in which, uh, you know, I was uh, uh, trying to sort of even look uh, at how uh, uh, in different contexts, even within that particular, say, the indigenous context that I'm describing, even that, how uh, the moment the context changes, the people who, you know, the, the women who held power are suddenly removed from that, right? They become isolated. They have no critical mass uh, of support around them. They simply, uh, you know, they're, and, and, and so it just, 
and 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 that made me question as to the kinds of the kinds of normative um the kinds of normative relations or the normative subjects that Huck or the kinds of normative practices that Huck would allow and the limits of it. Uh, and, and I think the limits of it are often exposed when, you know, the subaltern subaltern, right? So the subaltern within the subaltern groups challenge and deploy. And that is why you see the limits coming up through that that word Huck will not extend. Um, you know, it's not something that, that you can use and that people will come around you and that you have become a collective. It doesn't work like that. Um, and it's all those cracks and all of those, um, um, uh, yeah. So I, I suppose, um, can I stop here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll be, you'll have other things to uh, answer as well when uh, when we open it up as I'm going to do now to, uh, to questions. So, um, uh, so now it's uh, open to other people to ask their questions. If you could use the, uh, the raise hand function, which is down at the bottom of the screen in reactions, um, and then I'll just uh, call on people in order, um, and you can unmute yourselves when you make your make your comment or uh, or ask your question. So, uh, open uh, open now to. Um, anyone who wants to um, wants to do that. So I'm just watching my screen. So for the moment people are still formulating their their comments and their questions. Um, <coughs> I also, um, I, I, I wonder if I could just come in on, uh, you know, what John was saying earlier about the ability of particular analytic frameworks to carry the weight. And I thought that was a great, um, it, was, it was, you know, it was very important um, and made me think. And I think that is also whether, say, Ian Hacking could carry that weight uh, of, uh, you know, the kinds of vernacular rights cultures or indeed, uh, you know, and, and, and that there were all of these different people being brought in. And I think that was one of the reasons I was supplementing all of these people, because I thought none of them are allowing me to do what I want to do. And, and so therefore hacking cannot be, I mean, I love the idea about focusing on words and concepts, making a people, but hacking doesn't talk about, although he's a Foucauldian, but he's not really looking at questions about the kinds of contexts I'm interested in and the kinds of power relations I'm interested in. And for me, that question of politics and power relations are absolutely, were absolutely super monumental. And, and so I had to bring in others who would then allow me to think about how, how does a making up of gendered subjects happen? And, and you know, so there were all of these people, all of these frames, frames that were kind of jostling in some ways. And, and, I, and I think I wanted that to come through a little bit and not neatly tie them together too much because then one wouldn't be able to see all the kinds of things that one needed to do in order to make, to, to allow um, a, a conceptual and epistemic capture. So it would allow me to do descriptive work, but it wouldn't allow me to do epistemic and conceptual work. And that is why all of these different <laughs> people and you know, were kind of brought and as you were saying, well, what are all these? And of course, yes, I agree with you. There are those cracks are there primarily to also mark boundaries because that's the limit of what that will do and no more. Uh, and therefore you need to constantly do this work of supplementation. Okay, thank you very much for that. And now I'm going to ask uh, Hazret uh, Setinkaya to uh, uh, just, if you just un unmute yourself. Um, yeah. Um, thank you, everyone. And that was really interesting. And thank you, Sumi. I've been so lucky um, that I read a little bit of the book. I really enjoyed it. I guess my question is more like, if you could comment upon the interventions that, uh, that, you, that you yourself see um, will, will kind of change the way we think about human rights. I guess I'm thinking about, um, if we think with human rights apparatuses and institutions, how do you see your work changing the way that they think or 
the way that the discourse globally function, uh, and I'm talking about human rights more globally, or do you see your work maybe as um, a starting point in developing future, future theoretical interventions, and that, that it might take a bit of time before, you know, the, your thoughts and your work is taken up by uh, global human rights institutions, practices, and maybe by more mainstream scholars. Like, I guess my my question is, how do we move this a bit from the from the from the from the per periphery to the center, uh, and make this part of the discussion? And if you have any suggestions of how one would go about doing that, thank you. Did you want me to come in then? Or should yes, we yeah, in? yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if you, uh, we have a, a second question, but I think it's best if you answer first. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Hasrat. Oh my God, you've asked me such a difficult question, Hasrat. We didn't agree on this one before. Okay, right. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I certainly see it as um, uh, I, I certainly see it as a as a as a starting point. Um, let me just say it that way. Yeah, I see it as an intervention in terms of a starting point. I, it would be great if global human rights folks pick it up. But you know what? I mean, in all my um, years of um, uh, the academy, and you know, I have a very conscious location. I have deliberately positioned myself in a particular place where I don't think that mainstream folks have any interest in anything I say. <laughs> I've never had for any years. I doubt if it's going to change. So, you know, and 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 that's okay. Uh, you know, and that's and that's totally fine. Um, uh, and and uh, because I think I, um, but I think what you've asked is actually about, um, You've asked about what kinds of uh, interventions might global human rights uh, discourses take away if they were so interested uh, from this work. Yes, is that is that I can't see you, so I don't know where you are. But um, yes, Hester, is that is that is that is that fair? Is that what you were asking mostly? Yeah. Yes, part of it. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think that. Um, I think the, the 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 key things that I'm hoping that that will be taken up quite seriously uh, is the kind of politics of origins and time space provincialism, right? That I that I point to, which is that uh, you know that uh, that there is that that I don't like using the word West, and uh, the reason I don't is primarily also why I say in the book that is also then used um, by authoritarian regimes for very particular purposes. And so we have to be really careful about the work that the West does, uh, you know, across the globe. So let's just be really careful about that. So let me just say that Eurocentrism is what I prefer, rather than using uh, West and the non-West and so on and so forth, primarily as what Kalpana was saying, the ways in which the West, uh, you know, does very particular kinds of work uh, in setting up uh, very particular kinds of um, uh, 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 relations of oppression and hierarchy in, in so many parts of the globe. Uh, so, uh, I, but I do hope that um, the politics of uh, uh, origins and uh, time space provincialism, time space provincialism within um, uh, political theory, philosophy, historiographies of human rights. So paying attention to getting out of that time space provincialism with the poli which the politics of origin institutes and makes possible. But the origins primarily also because that it is also a critique of the authoritarian regimes which use that politics of origin. So it's not simply only the West and, and you know, it's also the authoritarian regimes. And I sort of said, all of them find themselves in that similar boat. And actually the target of their attacks have been gender and sexual rights, right? And that is what you see around the globe in the name of being foreign, alien, and not part of culture, uh, not part of the origins and so on. And so I hope that that politically, that's the intervention and that will be taken up quite seriously by global human rights policy makers who then will not sort of go by sort of saying, oh, you know, this is not part of their culture. We have to do things differently and so on and so forth. Pay attention to the uh, mobilizations going on, uh, uh, you know, around the globe. Stop paying attention. Don't fall into that lazy uh, and convenient sort of, you know, um, quick um, sort of arguments. Um, I hope that it will also, um, so that, that's, those are the kinds of things that 
I'm uh, uh, particularly interested in. Uh, and, and of course, uh, by paying attention to what's going on in, 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 in most of the world, it would also mean that, just for one example, this is because this is the time that we're in, right? So if you think about the ways in which how those arguments, you know, uh, in relation to Afghanistan have again resurfaced, not that they've ever gone away, but about women's rights in Afghanistan have resurfaced again, all over again, that same kind of orientalist frame about, oh, look at what's happening in poor women in Afghanistan. And how, it is not to take away what's, ha uh, what's happening in poor women, uh, you know, uh, to women in Afghanistan, but look at the ways in which women's rights in Afghanistan only come up in a very particular kind of context, in a very particular kind of discourse, and no one pays attention to the, to the mobilizations or their politics or rights politics in Afghanistan outside of that, outside of context of conflict and outside of, con uh, of, of interstate conflict, right? So one's also got to sort of see those everyday rights politics challenges uh, are simply never paid attention to. And this is one of the other things that I'm hoping that through that intervention on a critique of politics of origins that that will shift, that will make also global um, actors much more, look much more carefully at what uh, nation states and authoritarian regimes are saying when they are making human rights arguments at various um, uh, international forums. So that may have been a, a difficult question, but I thought that was a pretty, uh, pretty good answer. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a second question from Niharika Pandit. This may be our last question because we're coming towards the end, but uh, over to you. And if you just unmute, then you can. Um, hi, sorry. I hope you can hear me. Hi, Sumi. Thank you for such an amazing book. And always very grateful to be learning from you. Um, so my question is more like, uh, I just want to know more from you. I'm wondering about the politics of translatability and language within the subcontinent itself, right? So um, especially when Kalpana mentioned that there is this, um, exactly, the state is using this idea of politics of origin to fixate on a certain idea of what does, who does the nation belong to, right? And there's a sort of dissociation from Urdu as a foreign language, right? And uh, to think of uh, equivalent of Haq in Urdu would like what comes to me is Adhikar, which is also very sort of surrounded in governmentality. So yeah. if you could talk more about tensions that you sort of uh, came across while speaking to different communities, and this is across both India and Pakistan. Thank you. Thanks, Neorika. Um, thank you, uh, super thoughtful um, uh, question. Uh, I, I was just, um, yeah, I mean, you know, we are in that uh, uh, context of politics, isn't it? That, that people are now, uh, that there is a removal of Urzu words from popular culture as far as possible. I think we are, we've just seen a couple of moves in that direction whereby it's now, um, it's now somehow seen as um, okay. I mean, it was always seen as okay, but you know what I mean? It's just seen as, it's just become much more strengthened. Uh, that's to call out Urdu as um, uh, uh, language of the uh, invader, foreign uh, Muslim and, and so on and so forth. And that was a really extraordinary thing that I found um, when I started looking at um, uh, the word Haq. Uh, and 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 also the politics. So there's a politics of Urdu language, of course, which is you know which uh, historians have talked about and how uh, you know that they, that there's a whole originary myth around Urdu and Hindi as as though they were two different languages, but actually they weren't um, in reality and so on. But there was a whole myth built around them, uh, uh, you know, um, particularly um, through a lot of support from the colonial state and, 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 and social reform, reform folks and so on and so forth, whereby for the first time, or at least in, not for the first time, and that would be making too big a claim, but, you know, but, but it becomes very noticeable that languages become associated with religious communities. And that is a very recent, um, at least in the subcontinent, and that's what historians have, have, have told us, and this happens quite recently. Um, uh, 
and what was when I was doing looking at how Hawk, the word Hawk um, occurs and the, the 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 work the scholars who worked on Hawk in different parts of the globe and particularly North Africa, uh, in East Africa and so on and so forth and I was quite struck by how much they were very much sort of locating Hawk as part of Islamic jurisprudentialism. It was very much part of, in some ways, what John was also sort of saying, you know, it has very particular meaning. Some, some of them are, uh, and not all of them are linked with Islamic jurisprudentialism. So, you know, linked with quite secular uh, meanings and so on. But the work on Huck that I was looking at uh, uh, primarily was located within Islamic jurisprudentialism. And as I started, but the, my ethnographies and my, you know, two decades of documenting the Huck within um, the oral tradition that Kim was uh, talking about earlier, uh, showed that actually nobody ever mentioned that this was uh, an Islamic term, right? And that nobody ever sort of gave that particular uh, sort of uh, connection to it. And that really struck me. And I was like, what's going on here? You know, no one says that, oh, that the A, that this was alien, this was not part of the language, that this was, uh, you know, that, that this was um, a term that uh, uh, the language that only Muslims used and so on. And, and, and this went right across. So Adivasi communities in Rajasthan, the Dalit communities and so on. And right across, the only thing that I was struck by was the gendered and casteist uh, uh, sort of nature of the term, right? The, uh, that's the normative meaning of it, which is very much linked to upper caste, linked to masculinity, and, uh, particular, uh, you know, that, that, that upper caste males used in relation to sharing property due. So what is due to one and, and so on. And so very much had to, that kind of links with property and so on. But not, and, and the fact that, that you were using it for your own self in order to describe your own um, sort of, um, uh, so, uh, you know, your own presence as a subject, particularly for Dalit and Adivasi women, is just completely new. It's not something that I've never seen happening, never heard anybody talking about it. And so it creates a whole bunch of more dissonances. In relation to Adhikar, what they often told me, oh, Adhikar is what, you know, if you, and remember, I'm working with communities again, going back to Kim's point. The reason why I'm looking at oral traditions and not print is because the communities I'm working with are, are not formally literate. They're politically literate. And I always make that distinction that you cannot call them I refuse to call them illiterate and, you know, and, and so on. They are not formally literate, but highly politically literate. Um, and, but they always told me that um, Adhikar is what, uh, you know, the, the, the folks in the city, the educated people in the cities use uh, the word Adhikar, right? Adhikar is a word for the right in Hindi. But we, uh, you know, here in the villages, in, the, in rural India use Hak, this is ours. Adhikar is again also, as you rightly said, it's linked with officialdom, it's linked with bureaucracy, it's linked with official power, state power, right, Sarkar, but Hak is something that belongs to one, and you can take it back, and you can snatch it, and it has that kind of normative power, so does that make any sense? That's wonderful, wonderful, Sumi. Um, uh, there is another question in the chat, but I think I'll just have to leave that for you, for you to sort of follow up uh, afterwards. This has been a, a really amazing session. Uh, I think we're all enormously grateful to you, Sumi, for your book, uh, and also enormously grateful to the panel for your contributions today. So um, many congratulations to everyone. <laughs> and uh, and um, I, I hope and I'm sure that this book is going to be a, a really great success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks so much.